I think we should, oh, I want to sort of circle back in, in your opinion on technique overall. Technique, is it a causative factor for injury? Um, we are very of the mindset because we work with more performance athletes that technique is essential for output. There's certain qualities that are probably necessary for high loads and, and high force and high, but uh, yeah. 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 So essentially, like, where, where I know you said you're in the middle ground. It's not, it's not fucking, if you do this, you will die. And then it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. And then obviously the other, the other end, I don't know how I'm wording this question, but exactly like, where, what is your stance What's, overall? Yeah. It's, it's one dime. So if we're just talking about pain, it's just one dimension that could contribute to a person getting injured or developing pain. It's as simple as that. And it's never, when you start getting higher loads, higher velocity, and you start, you know, getting into that extreme level, it's, yeah. it's maybe more relevant. And I, I still don't think it's the most important. I still yeah. think fucking getting a good night's sleep the night before could be <laughs> just as important. Or not staying up on the piss all night is just as important. 100%. But then, but then I, I don't think technique doesn't matter. You just got to know when you need to apply it. If we just stick to the shoulder, which is what, what my niche is a bit, yep. there is some evidence that like external rotation strength weakness and scapular dyskinesis is a risk factor for developing future shoulder pain in overhead athletes like volleyball players and, and baseballers, for example. Those two things are definitely predictors of developing an injury. So is increasing load from one week to the next, which is kind of classic. Mm, yeah. But it's kind of the only thing, you know, like having a GERD or a glenohumeral internal rotation deficit and, you know, if your upper trap's firing a little bit earlier than your lower trap and your, are your pecs too tight, none of that predicts injury Anything, at all. Yeah. So like, but when you start deadlifting a thousand kilos or, or even half that, for sure, like technique's probably important. But we see world-class lifters and with shit is, technique. And, and this is it. It's, same it's, with it's, runners, same with everything. Yeah, it's the, it's then becomes the, it's how do we classify what good and what bad is and, and what makes that good for that person. But then yeah. someone can do the mirror opposite of it yeah. and still see great performance outcomes. And we get into load and load, it's just progressive load, structures of that. Like it's just the... There's so many factors to yeah, it. So yeah, so when, you when you're in the healthcare industry, you just have to take all of that. It's the artful application of science. You take the breadth of literature, you have to be read up, and then you apply it to a single individual, yeah. right? And you try and figure out, using your brain, what's going to matter for this person and what's not. And that's it. I don't see what the confusion is. Why should we average something out over 7 billion people? Yeah. And say you have to have a neutral foot or you have to have an acromiohumeral distance, which is the difference between your humeral head and your acromion of two centimeters. Like there's variance. There's, that's why we have something called a standard deviation yeah. and a confidence interval because we're all spread out or a normal distribution. We're all spread out in the middle and no one is really at the extremes. Yeah. So I just, I just don't understand the argument at a fundamental level. It, we, if you come down to the N equals one, the individual in front of you, patient-centered care, then all of these arguments just get lost mm. in translation. Yeah, yeah, a lot of the narratives do as well. Yeah. Um, another figure that I'd like to, um, Frank Impalazeri. Do you know much about? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because I know he's currently, uh, he he really cha challenges a lot of the the like the load thing. He really, yep. he's really put some good papers out and some discussion points on being like, maybe this load management thing isn't as set in stone as we believe acute to chronic workload ratio. Like what's your view on all of those sort of just like load management, not sacred cows. Cause they're not there, but they, they were really big rocks of what our understanding was. And now it's all of a sudden being like, Oh, hang on. Maybe there are other things here as well. Like everything. We were too quick to think that it's going to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. Like what we did with isometric exercise for tendon For tendon pain. stuff. Uh, that's another one that's starting to get, yeah. It's, yeah. Honestly, so that was the work done by Ebony Rio. Fantastic. Down in Melbourne. Beautiful work. Original work. And then we took it from a case study on seven people and applied it to seven billion. Yeah. And again, it spawned an entire industry. This is what we did with fucking core stability for low back pain. Yeah. Created Pilates just about, you know. That's why every physio, <laughs> that's why every physio clinic has a reformer in it. Yeah. Anyway, we did the exact same thing with load management and the, Tim Gabbard did the work. Tim, Tim Gabbard is a genius when it comes to it. He did brilliant work. But then we extrapolated. He's another Australian, isn't he? He's an Aussie, yeah. yeah. And he works with every NBA team, yeah. every, every NFL team on load management. Oh, really? He's killed it. Yeah. But we just that we just would too think too quick to think this is gonna change the way we're gonna do things. And then Franco Impalazari, who's a brilliant researcher, 
goes back and looks at some of this stuff and reanalyzes the research and finds, you know, maybe there's some holes in it. Maybe there's some discrepancies. Maybe, maybe there's methodological flaws. He did the same thing recently with Nordics. Uh, Nordics. Ripped Nordics. Yeah. And that's another one. An industry has been built on it. it Nord boards and all this Every sort of AFL stuff. Every AFL team has to do a certain amount of uh, Nordics and Premier League teams in soccer especially. And maybe it's just been based on not much. Yeah, Frank, I love Frank. He's like the Batman of yeah. of uh, research currently. He's just just he is the, the 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 man we deserve. What is it? The man oh, I suck at quotes, man. <laughs> Fuck me, the man we don't deserve deserve, but uh, the one we, we need, need. The man we oh, need. Oh my god, I got no idea. That would be a laugh. <laughs> Someone's gonna meme that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's fascinating because the acute, acute to chronic workload ratio, like it used to. Tim Gabbett gave you like these recommendations of like one point six and point eight and all of these sort of. If you train too much, you're at risk of injury, but T- doing too little, you're detraining, and then we hit that sweet spot. Yeah, yeah, which I think the whole concept. It's good concept. Yeah, the concept of like progressing load in a logical, manageable manner makes so much sense. But it's when you start to throw these figures on it, and then you start yeah. telling people, "Hey, you've done too much. You're going to get injured," and then that starts it's, the psychological thing. It's and a, then it's a great theory. The Goldilocks formula is has been around in coaching and sports science for centuries. Yeah. Right, you got to get the load just right, mm. and th- that's not. That's not revolutionary. Having this number of 0.8 to 1.2 and you can't increase load, if you go beyond 1.2, then you blow up. It just hasn't borne out, you know, but you still have to manage. Like, you know, if I ran 100K last week and I've never done that before, is it wise to do 120K this week? Probably yeah. not, you know, like you probably stick to that or, or taper off a little bit, you know, like, and then you've got to look at what else you've been doing, sleeping, nutrition, all that kind of stuff as well. So just to reduce injury risk down to loading was a bit reductionist, but I think it has some value. Yeah, and I think yes. sporting teams should look at it. You look at the Australian cricket team and uh, fast bowlers, if they bowl a certain amount of balls in the net or they bowl 50 overs in a match, they'll have a quieter week. And I think that is generally a smart thing to do. Yeah, yeah. I th- yeah. I, they used to cop flack for it, resting players. Resting. And, and Pat yeah. Cummins rested for a decade. <laughs> Just about. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, they used to cop it when they would they would rest. And, and, and like you get these big figureheads like LeBron James is like, I'll never take a break because some kids bought a ticket to see me play and stuff like that. But then like, yeah, it's just, a, it's a fascinating, when you actually look at it from all the, all the different angles, it, it, it makes... Remember the Favola story? What was that? It was on the radio. Which like one? That, it, was like that, it was about kicking, about goal kicking. He's like, yeah. I'm a fucking goal kicker. And they told me to stop kicking goals. He's like, so I'll take a b- bag of balls to a park after and just keep, drop, just keep punting kicking. them through the big sticks, Mark. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> let's go back to the Nordic thing because that is a new challenge that has been brought forward. I didn't, I, first of all, I never, all I knew was it was super maximal eccentric loading. That was the, the, because sprinting is, you can't replicate it in the gym. So they created this sort of like high load eccentric, but the velocity is so slow. I didn't, I never really saw the connection for it. What was the original thought of Nordics? What was the, I know we're outside of your realm here, but you'd probably have more understanding than what we have. I don't know the original thought of it. It's Something about fascicle length. I yeah, remember. yeah. Sarcom, exactly. Yeah. So I, I do know, but I don't know the specifics. Yeah. yeah. I don't know the yeah, original theory. Yeah. Um, so it was meant to increase sarcomeres, which are the contractile component of muscle spindles or muscle fibers, yep. e- effectively. It was meant to make your muscles longer and stronger so you could handle kind of like end of range hip flexion or something like that. Yeah. So it was meant to uh, provide contractile, um, increase the contractile length of your hamstring muscles. Yep. So you wouldn't tear because most ha- hamstring injuries might occur in footy, for example, if you're getting way up into hip flexion, Nick Rewalt. Uh, tore his proximal hamstring off his bone um, when he did that. A lot so, of the times when they're like bending forward yeah, to pick the ball up and they're really, it. yeah. yeah. So the theory with, with Nordics was that was actually going to make the, the strength and, and capacity and robustness of the hamstring more at greater lengths. Yep. And then what does Frank said? Uh, so he didn't argue really with the mechanism of it, more in just how effective is it in preventing hamstring injuries. Yeah. Um, and so he sort of reanalyzed some famous systematic reviews out there, which he said, and, and the catch cry was that Nordics reduce hamstring injuries by 50%. Oh, really? Mm. Yeah. Okay. And then he said- And there's your no, industry. They don't. And exactly there's your, right. your industry pops up. 100%. Yeah. So if you're the head of uh, sports science or the head of medicine or the head of whatever at, at Collingwood, and you don't institute something that, that has that yeah. evidence, you're going to get the sack. Yeah. And if Pendlebury tears his hammy, especially, you know, so- 
So, so all of these clubs took that on, and then then Franco went and reanalyzed that and found out it was probably not as um, as strong of a recommendation as that. Yeah, it, it's interesting. It, it just makes me think like, what else is going to start to get challenged? Like our understanding. Do you see any other? And maybe just come back up to the shoulder. Do you see research moving in a way that's different things? Maybe have weak foundations. Or? So I'm I'm controversial in publishing about strengthening for shoulder pain. Oh, really? And yeah. so this might not be what you want to. No. Your audience wants to hear too much, but. Um, I published a paper last year that's gone viral and I got a lot of hate for it that suggests that getting stronger, actually increasing your shoulder strength is not really needed to recover from shoulder pain. Even if you do shoulder strengthening exercises. The typical stuff that we do all think about. Yeah, Yeah, but even like better stuff, even like, you know, like one to six rep failure stuff. Oh, all right. So really pushing it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So even proper strength and conditioning design studies where you're doing these like high load or high intensity strength training exercises to increase strength, strength is often not a mediating factor, which means it's it, strength doesn't need to change to improve pain and, and, and shoulder function. Yeah. Which is... So another thing that I've, I've been quick to call out over the last five years is that we thought that strengthening was going to cure everything. Strengthen the back, strengthen the shoulder, strengthen the quad for knee pain, and you'll be sweet. And it's a nice theory, and I tend to support it. I think there are a lot of benefits to strength training apart from just getting strong, and I have published on that, so don't misinterpret (laughs) me. But it's not just about getting stronger. So it's as reductionist and saying you got to switch your core on or you got to have perfect technique. It's always a interacting kind of complicated scenario as to why somebody gets better from pain, not simply increasing their maximal voluntary contraction against a dynamometer. You know? Yeah, yeah. It'd be other things like just movement and, and getting moving. And, movement and like, quality, yeah. confidence, fear, yeah. self-efficacy, all these things, you know, like fear avoidance, marking time, <laughs> reassurance, you know, marking time, meaning you're just kind of distracting someone while nature takes its course. Yeah, yeah. Regression to the mean, yeah. ceremonial effects, reassurance. That's why some people go to a guru, they give them an explanation, they're happy with that, they walk out feeling better. All of these factors are going on underneath the surface of them doing an external rotation movement, you know? Yeah, it's not just the physical quality of strength. That is not that at is all. Getting, it's tip of the iceberg. So I'm, I'm assuming then that you could really just label exercise as in general, within that same discussion that je- exercise is probably like, as you said earlier, you like alluded to it, but like the, the manual therapy guys cop it, but when exercise is actually looked at it in isolation as well, it's like, oh, it's not actually that much better for pain. It's not any better at all. Really? Can't just say like graded exposure fixes everything. Like it's not the, you, you it's could. Not. Yeah. There's bad evidence for that though. Like graded exposure is another thing that's, we're kind of running with at the moment a little bit. It's the new thing. I, I like that as a philosophy, but you don't have to do graded exposure, mm. you know? Mm. So for pain relief, right, everything is almost as is as good as each other and it's all kind of shit. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, it all works like it might reduce your pain by like two points out of 10 yeah. over three months. Yeah. Mm. And manual therapy is equal to dry needling, is equal to exercise therapy, really? both like motor control, strengthening, all the exercises you want to try, stretching of your pecs, all of that kind of works the same. But I, I preach resistance exercise and strength training because it makes you a healthy and individual. There's so many other qualities that come <laughs> along for that ride. Exactly. Yeah. It's bang for your buck. And if yeah. you only got a few months with a patient, fucking don't waste it stretching against a doorway yeah. for three months, you know? Yeah. Actually try and change that person's health behaviors. Yeah. Get them in the gym a few times a week because three quarters of the population is undertrained. Yeah. And if that's, you know, they're going to lead to chronic diseases and so on and so forth. So get them going, get them training. I think exercise is the biggest bang for your buck at the moment, given that it's no worse than other intervention and it's better for secondary health benefits. It makes the most 